Welcome to the Film Florida podcast. I'm John Lux, and I'm the executive director of Film Florida. Today, our guest is Bradley Battersby. Bradley is the head of the film program at Ringling College of Art and Design, which is one of the top film schools in the country. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today, Bradley. Absolutely. Good to be here. Let's talk your origin story. How did you get your start in the industry? I started in commercials. Um, I was in New York. I had studied theater in college. So all my fellow classmates headed off to New York to make it on Broadway, et cetera, in theater. And I went along, uh, even though I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I always wanted to be a director. I wasn't so much an actor, but that was my group. So I went off to New York, too, and I absolutely love New York. And uh, the only game in town, though, film-making-wise in those days, was Madison Avenue. It was basically commercials, advertising. And so I worked my way up as a production assistant, and then I did a uh, sample film, a little spec short that had a lot of uh, advertising commercial production value in it, set it to great music, and uh, uh, that was my calling card. And I got a couple of offers to work on staff at some production companies and uh, started off with quite a, a, a good one called Bean Con Films that had earlier been wild films that went way back into the golden age of advertising in the 60s where they did, uh, oh gosh, they did Volkswagen and Alka-Seltzer, I can't believe I ate the whole thing, all that kind of stuff. So that, that was a legacy company, and it was kind of interesting and great to be the young guy at the company in, at this very historical uh, production company. So that was my, my start, and then eventually um, I got the bug to do features, we were actually developing uh, Bernard Malamud's book, uh, The Natural, into a, a feature-length screenplay at that time. And so I was going through all the drafts with uh, the, uh, Buddy Conn and Bob Bean, who was going to be the director, actually. Um, and so then I saw how it turned out. And then, I, you know, I just, I just really wanted to tell stories. So I ended up going to the AFI in L.A., and uh, that was a great kind of launching pad for my career as a feature writer and director in Los Angeles. So how did you find your way to Ringling? Because you, you started in Ringling in 2009, right? Yes. Uh, right after I directed my first feature film, a movie called Blue Desert with Courtney Cox and Philip Baker Hall, uh, it got good reviews. It got it, it for a very low budget independent film. It 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 got a, a very adoring audience, and uh, my name came to the attention of the main media workshops. It was called the main photographic workshops and main filmmaking workshops then. It's now the main media workshops, but they do these one week intensive workshops with professionals from uh, the industry. And they were offering a course called uh, the First Time Feature Director. And Mark Rydell, who is quite a storied, legendary uh, a director, did On Golden Pond and many, many other movies, he was set to teach that one-week uh, intensive workshop. But he got a job at the last minute. And they were uh, kind of desperate. And they called me up. And at first, I just didn't see myself as a teacher at all. I didn't see how that related to me. I had never thought of myself as a teacher in any way, shape, or form. I was completely involved with my career and trying to get projects off the ground. So at first I told them no, but then I started thinking, well, you know what? This is a new adventure. I have to kind of embrace it. So even though there, I only had three or four days to prepare and I knew this was going to be like from eight until midnight every day for five, six days, I, I went for it. And uh, I was surprised that I actually, I actually had something to say. And even though the students kind of got the bait and switch, which I felt bad for, but I was very upfront about, they, uh, 
eventually embraced me. And I think they got a lot out of it, and I got very good uh, responses, um, evaluations, and the school asked me back uh, to actually start a, a resident program, a, a residency program in film for a master's style, uh, some kind of master's degree. And uh, so I got started on doing that in Maine. So that was really two of my first uh, valuable experiences in the teaching realm, not only teaching, but also becoming a kind of a leader of a, a what is the ideal film school because that's that's when I first started to really look at film ed education and start to think about it as a way to address some of the issues of the difficulty of film education and and how I could surmount that and how I could create the best out of nothing out of out of a new school. So that's, that's, what, that's where that began, but it was short-lived. My career called me back to Los Angeles almost immediately, but I had the exercise. I got the exercise of doing it. So I combined my career with teaching from that point on pretty evenly. I taught at a lot of film schools in Los Angeles, UCLA Extension, uh, Chapman University, uh, LA Film School, uh, the uh, uh, AFI, where I had been a student years earlier. I actually started teaching directing at the AFI. So, uh, and then I started a film program for uh, advanced high school students, that, uh, a program that was associated with USC uh, up in Idlewild, California, called Idlewild Arts. And, uh, that was the first program that I was able to actually put into play all of my ideas. I ignored the fact that they were high school kids. I basically wanted to create the best film school, period. So I got, that was my creative playground to research and develop the, some concepts that I've refined over the years and have brought down here to Ringling starting in 2009. So this is exactly 10 years that I moved to uh, Sarasota, Florida. So when you started at Ringling, what was the immediate short-term goal? Like what did you want to accomplish in the first year? And then I'm sure you also had long-term goals to say, you know, where do we want to be 10 years from now? Um, what did you have in your mind when you first started there? Well, uh, what I had in my mind when I first started here was uh, a pretty stark picture. Um, Ringling College is a private, not nonprofit uh, uh, institution, art and design. And for most, compared to most uh, uh, higher education uh, institutions here in Florida, it's pricey. All, every state school is significantly cheaper. And uh, so the competition was tough. The school, had had, they tasted success. They were one of the early schools that got involved with using computers to make art back in the 1980s. And they came up right alongside Pixar with regard to computer animation. And computer animation from about the mid 90s on became Ringling College's legacy, that was their, their ideal program. That was the program they were out in front of everybody um, because they, they really aligned themselves with the industry very smartly, and they literally came up right alongside the development of uh, Pixar and uh, DreamWorks and uh, all the, the uh, digital computer animation uh, programs in the industry. And uh, they had a 100% placement for that program, uh, which is unheard of, astounding. It's a very successful program. But they didn't realize when they started the film program in 2007 that really computer animation at alone is very much a niche program. It, there's not a lot of competition for that. Um, assert, certainly with the way Ringling was doing it. However, they had created a very generic 
film program, thinking that j they could kind of rely on their good name and uh, attract students that way. Well, after two years, they only had nine students. Um, they had already gone through two department heads who could not figure out how to attract students with that particular tuition cost and the lack of any kind of visibility and knowledge of the program. They didn't have an advertising budget. So the immediate first issue was to build enrollment and get our name out there. And meanwhile, and uh, uh, simultaneously, it was up to me to give our program character, to find out what was unique about it, and be able to talk about it to students and to prospective parents and people in the industry. So I moved outside the <laughs> Ivory Tower community almost immediately to uh, garner uh, help by creating partnerships with community members who love film, but who had some um, resources, financial, um, that could help me start to do the kind of things that had been, I, had, I had discovered were very valuable when I was at the AFI, which is namely bringing in professional filmmakers, famous filmmakers, like Peter Weir and Sidney Pollack when I was at AFI, and uh, giving the students a direct access to um, top flight talent like that. And, but here in Sarasota, how do you do that? Because in LA, where AFI is, it's one thing to ask somebody to come across town and spend two hours with you. Here, you have to fly them in, put them up. They're going to spend two, three days anyway. So it was a challenge. But fortunately, my pitch worked. There were a lot of people, it turned out, in, uh, Ring, uh, in Sarasota who loved film. Didn't necessarily, weren't necessarily great art aficionados, so they hadn't really connected with the college yet. But we created a whole new set of uh, donors. And activated the community just in terms of their love of filmmaking. And uh, so, yeah, I may have had nine students at the time in my auditorium, but I had 50, 60 members from the community who were avid film lovers. And they helped me create a program called the Studio Lab, which was, uh, we called it a standalone enrichment program. It wasn't part of the curriculum as such. But we brought in, uh, in that very first year, Werner Herzog as our very first guest. And he was fantastic. He's an amazing teacher. He's uh, probably one of the more inspiring, most quotable directors uh, that have ever lived. And he was fantastic uh, with the students. And he loved what we were trying to do here at Ringling in terms of creating a film school for the 21st century. Not look back, but go completely embrace what was real and demystify the art and craft to help students feel comfortable like they can actually do it. He loved that. So he's at, he actually ended up coming back three more times. But everybody talked after they came here. Everybody talked. And Hollywood is all about networking. And so more and more people were coming here and uh, getting impressed and then going back to Hollywood or New York and saying, oh, you got to look into Ringling. We wrote a, a grant that first year, too, to the um, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And we called it Design and Film because uh, Ringling's an art and design college. But they have very little understanding or commitment to the art department, to production design, which is a, a huge department and a great way for many, many filmmakers to get their, uh, you know, get their foot in the door of filmmaking. So we brought out the legendary costume designer, Ann Roth, that next year. And then we brought in the uh, legendary cinematographer, Wally Pfister, um, who was Christopher Nolan's cinematographer at the time, did the Dark Knight trilogy, did Inception, did Moneyball. Um, he spent an entire week with us, as did Ann Roth, because the uh, a grant from 
the academy was very generous and we we documented everything we sent it all back and in 2011 we showed up in the center spread of the academy's annual report with Wally Pfister working with our students on our soundstage and suddenly we were on everybody's tongues in Hollywood and it was that year that we also uh, were included on the Holly, on Hollywood Reporter's Top 25 Film Schools list. We came in at 24, and even though maybe we weren't quite ready for that kind of uh, honor at the time, the school wasn't quite up and running yet, um, the program, I took it because suddenly that next year we had 51 new students coming in. And so, you know, that was the long term of trying to build the enrollment, uh, create a curriculum that demystified filmmaking that was very, very hands-on, that aligned with the industry, industry standard tools, industry standard processes and protocol, and it was working. We've had the Studio Labs done tons. We've built new sound stages. It's, it's been fantastic. So you had mentioned in there uh, the ranking. And the last couple of years specifically, Ringling is high up in those rankings. What do you attribute that success specifically to, and how do you sustain that level of excellence? Because there's, there's now an expectation through the, with the students as well as, as the faculty and the general public that Ringling is going to be in those rankings every year. How do you sustain that level of excellence year after year now? First of all, we, we did move up the ranks. With, I think we moved from 24 to 23. Then I think we were at 17. Then we went to 16. And uh, even at 16, however, you look at the film schools uh, ahead of us, they almost all have graduate programs. This is an undergraduate program. It's very unique. We did put our personality, uh, we did put a personality on this particular program, and that was by becoming the most intensive, hands-on, production-based undergrad program in the country. And we have achieved that now. And so people, students who do their due diligence, people who uh, from across the country and all over the world now, when they look at our predict particular program and compare it to any other hands-on production-based program that's undergrad, they'll see many more opportunities, many more opportunities to work with. So our studio lab guests, like Forrest Whitaker and uh, uh, Andy Garcia, people were starting to actually hire our students. And so we've started a program where we encourage them now, beginning a couple of years ago, to come to Ringling and make their passion projects with our students directly. So our students are actually getting professional credits on their resumes even before they graduate. And they're working with people like Kevin Smith, Justin Long, Dylan McDermott, Tim Sutton. Tim Sutton made a feature film uh, with us uh, in 2016, and it went to Sundance. And those students who worked on that film, we sent them to Sundance, and they're all working in the industry now. I mean, they network. They, you just open the door for these students. And, you know, if they're trained well, they understand production, and that's, that's our goal here in terms of our education, then the, you know, the opportunities are there for them if they can get their foot in the door. So that's what we've been doing. And there's not an undergraduate program that can kind of compete with that. Um, it's kind of crazy. And same way with our facilities. We, um, as of this past year, we've moved into our new home, which is a full city block it comprises two sound stages, uh, 8,000 square feet each. One is academic only. The other one is designed to be academic and to be shared with professional productions um, that use students. Um, and then we have a post-production center that includes a state-of-the-art dubbing stage, Foley stage, recording studio for recording music, and two uh, smaller 2,000 square foot insert stages. So we're pretty serious here. We're, we, we have four grip trucks. You look at other schools, hardly any other school has grip trucks. We have uh, 
four grip trucks because quite frankly that's how you work on location um, in in the industry you work off the truck so again it's creating a program that aligns very carefully very closely to the industry and all the faculty and all the staff have that kind of experience and they're able to bring that to the classroom in 2017 I mean I think I know why you won this award but because you've just kind of outlined a lot of that information. But in 2017, you were named Variety's Mentor of the Year. Talk about that honor, why you believe you were chosen, and what it means to you. Well, I think it came out of all this activity. Quite frankly, you know, we really did put the pedal to the metal there in that, those 10 years. And uh, it started to pay off, and there were a lot of guests who had come through here, um, we tend to have about five, six major guests, famous and not so famous, but famous in the industry. People like cinematographers and sound designers who come here who nobody would necessarily know their name, but in the industry, they're highly celebrated. We just worked with Andy Armstrong, who is a legendary stunt coordinator. He, he is part of the Armstrong family, stunt family. His brother Vic Armstrong doubled for Harrison Ford on all the Indiana Jones movies. Andy did uh, recently, he's, he's stunt coordinated many, many movies, but he recently did uh, Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2 and the Thor movies. He's been doing the Marvel movies. And his wife is a stunt driver, a stunt motorcycle driver. His uh, kids are all in the business. And so he came out, and he was blown away with how we do things just like in the industry here. And uh, he's done two projects with us now, and, and we hope to have him here on a yearly basis as, so that the Armstrong School of Action can become part of the Ringling Film Department. It's all part of this uh, kind of pre-professional plan to give our students the kind of experience and resume credits that they would never otherwise get. I mean, a, a lot of student films are obviously made in homes, rooms. You rarely do a car chase. You rarely do a shootout with explosions or you throw people out of buildings or set them on fire. Well, quite frankly, if you do get success, if you're lucky enough to get successful and you do become a director, you're going to do a car chase uh, eventually. You're going to do a, a fight, a stunt fight. And uh, most directors just step aside because, you know, they've never had that experience. But our guys have had. And we will, uh, we're hoping to continue this relationship so that almost on a yearly basis, we do some kind of outrageous, really interesting stunt or st stunt in the films we do either with uh, uh, visiting professionals or even in the student films with uh, somebody like Andy Armstrong. So it sounds like your success at Ringling has been a direct result of you putting your students in the best position to be successful for the rest of their career. Has that kind of been your philosophy? Oh, yeah, and it fit right with Ringling's uh, philosophy when I got here. I kind of knew that this was the right atmosphere um, when, I, when I first visited. I knew that they were struggling and I knew a lot of people had tried and failed to try to get the department off the ground. But I also knew that their philosophy and, and their heads were on very straight. One of the things that we talk about here at Ringling all of the time is that our particular curriculum and our particular approach to teaching the art is to always keep it student-centric. Um, students come first, absolutely. It's putting ourselves in their shoes. What are the challenges they're going to face right now, next year, when they graduate? You know, how can we adjust and be most prepared to have, get them most prepared to be able to be successful in whatever they want to do? We teach a very generalized program, so they all learn all the jobs in the first three years. Each, you know, they learn all the disciplines that go into a filmmaking crew um, in the first three years, but we encourage them to, in their fourth year, 
to then specialize in one or two disciplines. So by that point, they discovered, uh, you know, I really do know now that I want to be a screenwriter or a producer or an editor or cinematographer or production designer. And uh, so then they focus on that. And uh, again, that's valuable because, again, that helps us help them where we, we see what's going on in the industry and we, we keep the network going and we create friends and we use those connections to help our students. We talk a lot about technology on the podcast. Just in the time that you've been at Ringling, there are things that are commonplace right now that weren't even a topic of discussion 10 years ago when you started. So how has technology changed the film program at Ringling, and what is your philosophy in terms of trying to keep up? Well, the innovations that have occurred in the technology and the film business have really been key to our success here at Ringling, starting with the basic digital technology, the cameras that the early DV cameras that could finally do 24P that would uh, reproduce an effect that looked closer to the 24 frames per second of a film camera. What it did for film schools is that it suddenly made acquiring imagery that was pretty good, but most of all very affordable. So suddenly the concept of doing decent filmmaking, you, you weren't compromising too much. The same, way came, uh, the same thing came about through digital nonlinear editing, Final Cut and Premiere Pro and, of course, Avid, uh, all those, that software, along with green screen, visual effects, compositing. All this suddenly became more and more affordable and we didn't have to think about it so much because in the old days to acquire a decent 16 millimeter camera was a big deal. Um, to acquire a moviola, a flatbed, a, a, you know, that, that was a big deal. Now it's made rolling out a film school much easier. Um, lately, the uh, revolution has given us the ability to actually purchase the exact same cameras that are being used on major motion pictures and television shows now. So we have, you know, the latest and greatest uh, digital cinema cameras. We have fantastic lenses. Lenses never kind of went down in price, and maybe they're going up in price, but now by being able to afford some of the le stuff that we couldn't afford in the old days, we can start to save our money and purchase decent lenses. LED lighting, oh my God, that is the new revolution right now. I mean, uh, the cost of this stuff is coming down. They're getting more and more powerful. They're incredibly user-friendly with regard to color temperature, and uh, you don't need a generator. We used to have to tow a generator behind our truck. Or we had to tie in that incredibly horrible, you know, prospect of, uh, you know, safety, electrical safety. We don't do that anymore. The, the cameras have gotten more line sensitive and the LED lights, which don't take hardly any electricity, are getting more powerful. We have a Mole Richardson LED tenor. And this is a massive light. It's huge. But you can plug it into a household circuit. And it's like having the sun in, in a room. It's a beautiful light. It's daylight balanced. Uh, it doesn't, it's not multicolored, but it, it is daylight balanced. But it's just a fantastic, beautiful light. And you can touch it. You can touch the barn doors and not be burned. So, it, it, yeah, um, we're actually starting to show the students now how to make their own LED lights because the technology is becoming even more affordable and you, because they don't burn hot, you can actually build lights with plastic sockets and, uh, or foam core and paper, and it's not going to start a fire, um, but you're building your own lightweight 
very powerful lights you can plug in anywhere for just uh, less than $100 and with stuff you can purchase at Lowe's and Home Depot. So we're, uh, we're very excited with technology and we stay on top of it all the time to see what, how we can take best advantage of that technology. So it's a very, very ideal time to have film school and go to film school because that kind of stuff that no longer hardly gets in the way. I've read a little bit about you, but some of the stories and, and the history, this has been an amazing uh, podcast for me to listen to, by the way. Yeah, yeah, you can probably tell I'm very proud of our program. I'm proud of the work everybody's done here, how it's all come together, because it was surmounting an impossible odds. And to be able to have the kind of support of the community and the school and my faculty and staff and even the students, to try something new each and every year and not be afraid to, you know, kind of go for it and, and not, not stand on dogma. Uh, we've, we've, been ta- we've taken advantage of the fact that we're young here, right? So I uh, have really enjoyed speaking to you today and, uh, you know, a lot of fun. Thank you. We, we've enjoyed having you. So that'll do it for this episode of the Film Florida podcast. Thanks to Bradley Battersby for joining us. And thank you for listening, of course. To learn more about Ringling College of Art and Design, visit ringling.edu. That's ringling.edu. And, of course, for more information about Film Florida, go to filmflorida.org, as well as any of our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn.